when so many people are trying to forget or turn their backs on, um, on kids in general, and particularly this population of students in our American schools. Um, uh, a uh, member of the Office for Civil Rights is uh, here, um, and uh, Erardo, I have specifically asked him uh, to be here because I think it is important uh, that we know that we're not talking about something fly by night or just coincidental or something that's unimportant that we might attend to when we get around to it. We are talking about how we prepare the citizens of this community, this state, this region, and this nation to take a competent, uh, step into a competent role in a part of it. And if we aren't helping, have, uh, uh, helping other people to have these conversations and then to know how to translate these conversations into act action, we will be shortchanging uh, our young men and women. I always say to folks as I talk to them around the country, who do you think you are that you can write kids off? I mean, just who do you think you are to think this group of students is so unimportant that you shouldn't be spending every moment of your waking time and effort to ensure that they have every opportunity they can to be competent, to be ready to go on to college, to successfully move into their careers and build a good life for themselves as part of, uh, parts of communities. Uh, you have no right to do anything less than that. And uh, we have to constantly remind people because they are, and I have found it, uh, being a, a director of an equity assistance center, many people who might try to route, write off those quote unquote undesirables among them because they make them look bad or because they show them up for what they're not doing for them or because they just don't seem to fit into the right places in the right kinds of ways and we can't seem to fix them enough to be ready for whatever it is we want them to do in school. And I keep saying just turn around and look them in the face and see who they are and say, do I have what it takes to really be of service to this year learner? And if I don't, let me get myself fixed up so I can do a better job with and for them. You know, we have to do that kind of thing and remind people that uh, they are not there by accident. They are a part of the community. They are there. They, in fact, their being there is the reason why we can even say that we're serving them at all. And so we have to serve them with their best interest at heart, not our best interest at heart. And that means that we have to do some fixing up of ourselves and the institutions around these kids that are not supporting them well, and the policies and the laws and the legislators and those people who are about everything else except doing right by kids. And, and when they do, we support them. And when they don't, we want to get them out of the way. We want to fix them up if we can. But if we can't, for whatever reasons, uh, we have to get them out of the way. And Erardo, that even means going back to some of the issues we talked about year, uh, years and years ago. I mean, there are people's predilections and their biases and their uh, racism about these kids and their classism about them that just says that they are just not good enough and they are undeserving. And so we shouldn't spend time with them and on them. We have to get past all of that and begin uh, creating new kinds of conversations. So I'm glad, happy, uh, that you were willing to take time today to begin those conversations and know the things that we need to be reminding people about where uh, uh, learners whose first language is not English or as they find themselves in our public schools or kids similarly situated. Because um, as uh, one of our earlier speakers were saying, it is about language and more than that. It's about class and race and who they're connected to and where they live and what their histories are, all of which is a part of what needs to be faced in order to make schools work better for all learners, and as we say at IDRA, and our, our president and CEO says all the time, to assure, not just ensure, but assure that every learner knows that he and she or she is going to be given the best opportunity they can. That should be guaranteed to them when they walk in the door. They shouldn't have to fight for that. They shouldn't have to crawl for that. They shouldn't have to beg for that. It should just be there because they are there. We assure good education for every one of these learners. We assure that good teachers are in front of them. We assure that powerful leadership uh, uh, helps to structure the environment for teaching and for learning. We assure that when they leave this place, they're not going to be worse off than when they entered. They're going to be better off because we worked 
to make sure that those kinds of things have happened. So I'll be very interested to hear what your conversations have been around your tables. And these uh, powerful representatives who sat with you are going to be representing the best of what you had to say. I noticed that some of you were writing down individual thoughts and so forth on your sheets. If there are any of those that you want to turn in, uh, this, the whole proceeding will benefit from those comments you have uh, to say as well. Um, I do want to start with question number five. I was directed to start with question number one. I think I prefer to start with question under, number five. And since I'm in charge, I can do what I want. <laughs> okay. No, I, I meant that in a good way. OK, listen. Uh, why is this issue important uh, to address right now, not tomorrow? Or I heard somebody say, well, once we take care of all the systemic stuff, then we can deal with this stuff. I said, no, 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 you can't. I mean, we took all of that time. Look how many more kids we will have written off. I mean, just think about it. Uh, so no, um, as we say at IDRA, we know, and others have said, we have to kind of fly this plane while we're building it. We have to do this stuff now. Why is this important right now? Becky, what did your table have to say? Yeah. What do you have to say? Well, actually, we thought that the answer to number five was Oh. Because we're a nation of bricks right now. Oh, that's right. We, By the way, the table. We identified right that we, we talked about Toyota, for example, having to import employees from another from other communities because we didn't have the numbers of prepared students who could um, get out of school, get a job there, and take one of those great positions well-paying positions. In the end, Palo Alto Community College had to create a program with Toyota to create a new engineering um, robotics uh, STEM training program quickly to prepare those, uh, those new workers. So we felt that the risk was not only that we're losing students, but that they are not prepared to be the workforce of the future and specifically the minority students who are emerging as the majority in this country have to build the economy of the United States. And we're not going to be prepared as a nation to do that. Latino kids specifically will be one third of all children by 2025 uh, of the children under 18. So we're in an, and I don't know how many of them are ELL learners, but a lot. So we're concerned about, um, the condition of this nation and its future leaders if we don't take action now. Thank you. Ms. Prosper, what would you add to that? I assume you're asking because I represent HEB. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, um, I think it's in line with what you said um, already. The fact of the matter is that the nation and the skill set that needs to move forward um, is predicated on education. At the end of the day, we acknowledge that um, without education and without educating every single one of the prospective partners out there that might come work for us, we will be at a disadvantage, not only as a company and our fellow companies. I talked to Toyota. I have partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and other people that, are, that are, um, have large corporations here, Tesoro, Valero, and my colleagues. We all acknowledge that it's not really seen as something to think about. It's, and it should be seen as the same thing as when you're investing in a 401k and you're looking at investments for the future, education should be seen the same way. Because in many ways, that is exactly what you're doing. You are trying to ensure that the payoff at the end of the road when a child is career ready starts at the very beginning. And so, you know, um, education uh, for all kids, regardless of, of language, but particularly for those that have the extra set of skill set, which is a second language, because that's how we see it. We see it as you already come with a skill set. You have another language already under your belt. We have, you know, partners already, you know, my age trying to learn Spanish um, as an additional skill set because it's worth something now in the marketplace. So as far as we're concerned, this is an investment in kids that are already skilled how do we ensure that they don't drop off? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with securing the future. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moreno, what would you add? We had a really interesting discussion 
um, not only about meeting workforce demands, but also uh, making sure that we prepare ELL students for, for college. Um, so it was earlier discussed, it's not only about providing adequate funding for ELL students, but also making sure that they're getting that high quality curriculum. Um, and Olga Kaufman, who's a longtime community advocate here in San Antonio, uh, talked about the, the Levi plant closing. And so you might have had a lot of uh, people graduating from high school um, that, that were ELL students and maybe weren't set on going to college um, when they started at Levi. Um, but when that Levi plant shut down, uh, they did not all have, one, one, the language skills, but also the high quality uh, curriculum in, in their education to go out then and find uh, other jobs that were comparable. And so that was a, a big part of our discussion, particularly around uh, the new legislation from last session in House Bill 5, and making sure that there is that high quality curriculum, that expectation for all students, including ELL students. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our beautiful campus. Uh, we, we had a, a, a challenge just to rein in all of the energy and the, the great uh, ideas that we had at our table. So uh, as we move forward, it was a great, uh, difficult challenge, and uh, what's it called a difficult pleasure to, to be able to synthesize all the information. One of the things in terms of uh, this, this question is that we have a field that's maturing. There's, uh, there are a lot of people who are doing work, not enough still, in the area of English language learning, in the area of educating uh, heritage speakers of Spanish and heritage speakers from a lot of different areas. Uh, some companies are coming up with uh, the capacity to uh, develop materials that are uh, much higher in quality uh, curriculum that is in Spanish, right? So. Uh, I think the time is now that best practices are beginning to emerge. There's a, a collection and a group of people across a lot of different areas who are interested in languages other than English uh, and across the professions that now's the time uh, to seize that moment and to work with those resources that we do have. Thank you. Any other comments from, yeah, go right ahead, Earl. And by the way, would you take a moment also uh, before you make your tables, comments, uh, to talk about some of the most current and most recent guidance around English language learners. I'm not sure if everybody's aware that there are there is updated guidance with regards to ELL students in our public schools. And if you don't know this, you might want to go online at the Office for Civil Rights or the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and look up this guidance. But uh, if you'll take a moment and talk about what it is, what it does. And in fact, if you'll go back even to the guidance um, around parents of English language learners, if, if you could just take a moment and do that, Leonardo. Sure, Dr. Scott. First of all, let me answer the, uh, the question, which was number five, sure. right? Hold why your do, mic uh, up. Why, why do it now? And I think the, uh, which dovetails into the, your question is basically, from our perspective, it's the law. It's the law now. It's not something that is uh, really a choice. Since 1964, Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VI has said, we have to grant children meaningful access to an education. And at least since 1970, with the uh, Lao Memorandum, the court agreed. The Supreme Court said, yes, that's the case. And I think that it would be um, overstating if I said that everybody does that. We probably would not be here. Uh, so it's not being done uh, across the board. Uh, so that's the reason why, another reason why it should be done right now. And it should have been done many decades ago. Uh, and I think everybody here, I mean, I see a lot of people that I respect that uh, have worked throughout, uh, at least in, in Texas and, and elsewhere, uh, to have strived to make it happen, but there's always new things that come up. And talking about the guidance, uh, this guidance that came out is a joint uh, guidance from the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Civil Rights Division and the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. 
And this is, in fact, the first uh, joint guidance that comes out from both uh, departments. Previously, there were are three memorandums that the uh, OCR office worked with, which was a 71 uh, memorandum, or 70, uh, 74, and then basically uh, eight, an 85 memo and a 1991 memo. Uh, and that's what we were using for enforcement. And this clarifies uh, substantially those uh, also memorandums and just Title VI in general, along with the uh, Equal Education Opportunity Act, which is something that DOJ uh, uh, enforces. We don't enforce the EOA, but we do enforce Title VI. And I would urge you to go back and read it carefully. It's, uh, it's 40 pages long. Uh, the previous memo was about 10 pages long. Uh, and it's it goes back, I've been doing this for almost uh, 20 years or so, and it goes back, and I think it details very well the problem areas that have come across. And this is not just in Texas, this is across the nation. So it's you'll find a lot of examples that will highlight problem areas from staffing to uh, children that are opted out, uh, segregation, which uh, also at some point included newcomer centers, um, talking about parental communication. Parental communication is a key component. I think that's something that we talked about in our at our table. And without just, it, it's pretty in depth as far as in, that the parents have to be able to participate, not just by reading the report cards uh, or being able to read the, the report cards, but also to be engaged in the other uh, s sort of social aspects of it too, the PTA aspects of it that are uh, intertwined with the educational component of the school, to be able to meet with the teachers, to be able to feel comfortable to go to the school and participate, not just to, not just when something bad happens, but also to be able to engage in a very positive manner uh, at the schools. So, uh, and another component within that is also when you have the special education or the gifted and talented or uh, those components also, there are a lot of parents in, not just in Texas, but in other places where they don't know about those programs and if the parent doesn't know and there hasn't been a, a historical uh, relationship with the, with the school district, then those children kind of leave, are, are left behind uh, on their own, many times just subject to a, a teacher who, who cares uh, substantially. But uh, just real briefly, let me, let me tell you real quickly just uh, what, it, what it includes, uh, this something that uh, it obviously covers the, the overall obligations under Title VI and the EOA. It's, uh, it's a more detailed explanation of what's required in order to be in compliance with uh, Title VI and the EOA. Uh, it's a joint letter, uh, which I think is, is, is special in itself. Uh, the examples of, of what is uh, not having been found to have worked, and also some examples about what has been found to have worked. So there's uh, both sides of the, of the coin there. Uh, it also mentions uh, the inner, interrelationship between also Title I's and Title III's and some of those requirements, which I think uh, puts sort of the whole federal aspect of it in, in perspective, uh, which wasn't done before. Another big thing is that uh, it mentions a lot the, uh, the SEAs, the, the state offices, which in the past uh, policy memorandums uh, it was. It seemed like it was directed more at the at the local, and that, although they were directed towards everybody. And I said, this is not something new. It's just an expanded guidance, but it does mention uh, the SEAs a lot more in in the letter. Uh, and I think that's something to to keep in mind as you're as you're reading it. Uh, I think that's. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought it important that that be in the room uh, because. 
uh, the guidance also suggests that there will need to be different kinds of resources to make these things happen for learners whose first language is not English. And that's a part of a conversation that we have been having ongoingly. I mean, if you want to put qualified teachers in front of students whose first language is not English, um, as was suggested this morning already, that means you have to get them certified and get them ready to be in those classrooms. And if the Lau decision of 1973 said, um, uh, um, curriculum should be in a language that is intelligible to the students. In this case, it was Chinese-speaking kids, but it applied to all kids whose first language was not English. Well, that means you have to get people ready to teach that curriculum in a comprehensible way. I mean, it just has implications for resource allocation and for people to try to be small. And answering those kinds of questions is to do a disservice to what public education should be doing for all kids under Title VI, not to deny a benefit to learners because of their language or their color or their um, 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 national origin. Uh, so we have to be careful that people are having the right conversations about putting in front of learners the right kinds of inputs so that they can achieve what is expected of them on the, on the outside. Uh, um, Raquel, I think you might want to say something uh, to the next question. So let me um, ask, we're going to just move on to the next question so that we can keep things moving along. That next question is number one. Given all that we've looked at and heard about today, what are your group's recommendations for improving the quality of education for English language learners, particularly at the secondary level? Okay, hello, my name is Raquel Mijares. Uh, what my group has said is raise the expectations for teachers. I believe somebody had mentioned or commented earlier about having that there's not that many to maintain the certification, you only need three days of training. So when in reality, we were talking about how the expectations, if we expect our students to be able to pass the test or to learn what they're supposed to learn, then we should expect the same things from the teachers. Me as a future teacher, I would like that expectation to be raised upon myself as well. I don't want for my own students in my future classrooms that if they take the STAR test or if they take any standardized testing and they don't pass, it looks bad on me, but at the same time, if my principal isn't helping me or my district isn't helping me to meet those expectations, then what is this good for? It doesn't make any kind of higher education. It doesn't make me want to value more of what I'm learning of what I'm doing. Thank you for that. Maybe would you add to what you heard there? Sure, I could probably go through a laundry list. Uh, our, our, our group was fantastic and very robust. Uh, opinions on, on this and we came from a background of attorneys of course like myself and uh, educators and administrators and researchers and uh, professors so uh, some of the things that we mentioned were uh, of course you know funding uh, and Marion uh, our funding policies to the educational resources that students actually need to succeed uh, so, for example, there probably needs to be a more updated study uh, of uh, the Texas uh, policy with respect to funding for uh, English learner or, uh, as some call it now, emerging bilingual students. Uh, also need a dashboard of more useful information on these emerging bilingual students within the classrooms. Uh, a limited more useful information so that the teachers know because given the the variety of backgrounds and uh, skills etc that students might have uh, teachers need to be able to access that information uh, the process for evaluating uh, new immigrants there needs to be some type of process so that you know what skills what background what classes etc that uh, students uh, have come in, so that's really important, uh, especially given a lot of this was steered because of the incredible uh, lack of uh, success that was noted by Dr. Castellanos earlier uh, throughout schools all across uh, Texas. And so it was aimed at trying to improve at least some of the processes that you can. Uh, and it would also entail, of course, uh, teacher training uh, programs, teacher retention uh, incentives, uh, because then once if you are able to train the teachers, uh, of course, it doesn't just mean on the pedagogical side, but inclusive of that would be some uh, ideological 
uh, training as well uh, for those teachers. Um, but also, you know, w once you have those teachers certified through an appropriate process, of course, that really measures uh, their skills in being able to teach emerging bilinguals, but uh, also to make sure that those, those teachers stay in the profession and don't just leave after two or three years. So those were some of the things that we talked about, trying to build a pipeline. It might include grow your own uh, program so that students coming out of certain districts will have that incentive to stay because they know the community and they know the community needs. Uh, so those were some of the items that we mentioned. Thank you, Dave. Martha, what would you add in terms of what your group talked about around these recommendations? Uh, my group talked about um, carefully looking at the research findings about schools and student performance and how we can implement um, any programs or anything like that based on the research findings of schools and, and the student performances and kind of looking at, um, again, better preparing teachers, providing them the support that they need in the classrooms in order for the students to be successful. And, um, and then looking at um, under identification of L's and um, what is the proper way to identify these kids and how to better service them. And Veronica, what would you, your group add? I'm trying to get as many of these recommendations into the taped record as possible. I will be collecting your handwriting, but um, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I do want to get as many of them into the taping as possible. Veronica? Okay. Thank you. We would also talked about more money we uh, said, and less restrictions. Because with certain funds, you're only supposed to buy um, based on so much or so much allocation and those types of things. So more money but less restrictions so that we're able to utilize them to where we need to utilize them. Um, and, and to kind of add to that as well, better guidance as well. I know that there was a document some time ago for um, state funding and how we can use it that's been gone, you know, out for a long time that hasn't been updated. So kind of some guidance on that as well. Um, also, we also talked about certification of teachers and um, maybe even considering as teachers come in, if it's in an ESL, we know it's going to be a secondary setting, that they're required to have their ESL certification coming in. And those that um, don't have it have a, like a two-year or sometime limit because once teachers are in to get them to get certified is that much more difficult and so um, having a plan in place of what that looks like either through, through our individual um, HR or through you know the, just something kind of given down and then um, also we talked about the motivation of teachers what are some other ways that we can compensate teachers to keep them so that they're able to to maintain and stay we talked about i don't know giving them an additional planning period giving them you know just something what could we do to so that we can motivate those teachers to stay and want to stay um and that goes someone else once we have those certified exemplary teachers there in place that we've trained and we've done all that work for them Certainly, we don't want to forget um, Dr. Jimenez Castellanos note that we do need more money. And sometimes incentivizing people by paying them more for the service that they provide. It shouldn't be overlooked. It should not be overlooked. Eddie, would you add your group's recommendations, please? Hello, I'm Dr. Eddie Rodriguez. I'm the principal of the Harlandale Stem Early College High School. And at our table, we were talking about how do we improve this quality uh, education for the ELL learner. And we, we, we went back and we continued to harp on the uh, certification process. As someone who's taught in certification courses and who is uh, vigilant of the types of certifications that are being provided, many of them are generalist certifications. And when you get a generalist certification, because I'm teaching a course right now at Texas A&M San Antonio, and the generalist, there's a lot of generalist uh, certification seeking students in my class. Little are they aware that when they do graduate, they're going to end up teaching mathematics because that's where the greatest need is. Because if you have a degree in mathematics, you're, you're seldom going to be teaching mathematics at a school. You're going to be actually out in the career field doing something else. So I have all these students in my classroom who are seeking generalist certification. And what's going to happen is they're not really going to know their content well enough to do justice. So they start out with a very weak content knowledge base. And then we give them ESL certification. And really, what good does that do? 
what good does that do? Because not only are they harming the ESL kid, they're harming the regular kid, the GT kid, every other kid in the in, in, in the classroom as well. So we went back to that, looking at the gentleness teacher certification that they, I think the state needs to go back and maybe readdress that a little a little further. We also talked about perhaps an idea that surged in the room, which was if special ed is receiving all of this money because they have or they put out this good plan back in the 60s. And the plan was to provide very tiered system of instruction, meaning you have a BD unit, you have this other type of uh, life skill unit, and you continue on with the special ed platform. Maybe that's something that we really need to focus on as well. We need to do that for the English learner. We need to say we have the incoming student. We have the incoming student who's now in secondary, who's very different because now this kid has hormones that are going crazy and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we need to focus uh, perhaps in creating these tiers so that the funding is actually going to be listened to. Also, we talked about if we're going to provide this funding, let the funding be on educationally, uh, educational materials that are in fact research-based, that they're not just fly-by-night materials that we're constantly seeing come up and, and go and come up and go and people are just making money and nothing has changed. Because if we had been using uh, research-based materials from the very start, we wouldn't have the dilemma that we have right now. So I think that would be critical. But at the same time, going back to what Veronica was saying, yes, let's look at research-based materials, but let's not be so strict on the spending that we can't purchase um, other items that are also uh, important. So um, those are some of the things that, that we actually talked about in my table as to what are some of the ways of improving the quality of education for the English learners. Thank you very much. Uh, for the sake of uh, full disclosure, in addition to Eddie's being a principal, he is also a board member at Edgewood uh, Board of Education. So just want everybody to know that as well. Okay. All right. We have about 12 minutes, so I want to deal with the second question, and I do want everybody to have time for a comment. So we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 people. You have about a minute and a half to, <laughs> to speak to your group's uh, concerns. But at any rate, uh, I, we're very interested in hearing what some of your table's conversation was around your greatest concerns about how ELL programs are funded and fund uh, um, and uh, the issue of funding equity with regards to English language learners or English learners. So Martha, if I could start with you at your end of the table and what were your group's comments about that? Uh, and take a couple of minutes to give those. Um, so one of the things we talked about is that we do get funding, um, but kind of going on what everyone else is saying, um, they're very strict on the funding and on, on what you can and cannot spend. And a lot of the times, uh, the people making the decisions as to where the funds are going or, or what they're being used, um, sometimes they don't have that background knowledge that they need to make those types of decisions for the district. Um, so we said... Um, how, how, is, how are the funds being used and then having knowledge on um, effectively spending that money. Thank you, Martha. Eddie, if you would, please. Sure. Um, our concern was, again, making sure that the funding uh, that was provided was uh, utilized on research-based material. That, that was our concern. And also that um, there be a very good accountability component to it, not necessarily with an assessment component, but more of uh, fiscal responsibility and making sure that the money is actually being implemented where it needs to be. In other words, we're trying to teach our students uh, a language and let's not go out and spend it to uh, put a green turf on a football field or anything of that nature because, oh, now all of a sudden we have all this money because we have a great number of English learners. But let's make sure that the fund is actually being implemented so that when the, the, the state comes in and checks, if possible, due to any method they, they can think of, that we're actually spending the money where it should be spent to address the need. Thank you. Yes, uh, one of the things that we uh, started off talking about was philosophically maybe stepping back and, and looking at the question of equity and funding equity for ELLs because there is there are funds that get uh, sent in one direction versus another. And so it might be re-educating uh, the community about, about equity and why equity sometimes means spending a lot more money on uh, English language uh, learning education. And so that was one of the components. Uh, another one was uh, looking at uh, the, how the funding is distributed uh, in primary versus secondary education. That was one of the things that was talked about uh, this morning that we we're doing pretty well in or 
relatively better in, in primary education funding, but at the secondary level, uh, there's a lot of disparity about how many courses uh, someone might have access to in terms of English language learning support, the math and science, or what might be called the STEM field uh, education. You know, it, it tends to drop off, and where people spend a lot of time in terms of uh, providing bilingual uh, help is in the English area. But what about math? What about science? What about technology? And how do we uh, look to fund that area as well? Thank you so much. David, I know uh, this has been your life, so to reduce two minutes, Sure. Uh, well, of course, you know, we again talked about the huge disconnect uh, between funding policy and the actual resources needed by individual students. We also mentioned the requirements, uh, the burdensome requirements for federal dollars and how they're spent uh, while still acknowledging the need to ensure that dollars uh, generated by students actually reach those students. Uh, but we also uh, discussed something that was kind of interesting because there's been a lot of discussion today about, well, maybe uh, bilingual funding should follow the special education model funding. And one of the issues that was raised was, well, wait a second, if we start breaking it down to you know, what kind of ELL student are you talking about? Yeah, that, that, it, it does resonate when you're talking about, well, what kind of needs do they have? But there's this historical link between the treatment of special education students and English learner students. And so how you communicate that is extremely important so we don't fall back on the, all the progress that we've made by trying to educate people the difference between the needs of an Eng uh, emerging bilingual student versus a special education student. Well, as was, we had a very intense conversation about it. this, the I most intense, I think, of all. Um, but as was stated, one of the issues was that uh, the majority of the money is spent in the early grades, and then you have very little funding for the higher grades. And the second thing that causes a problem is that publishers um, print everything around core right now, and lower, higher, lower. lower. And that the problem with CORE is that it doesn't give you the resources that you need for an ELL program. So you end up using local dollars for, uh, for, for purchasing those uh, supplemental resources. And then you have to face finance office that has no understanding of the ELL needs. And that is very aggravating because they're in, they uh, if I could quote Moises, he said, well, they run that office like a for-profit. They want to show a profit at the end of the year, and it's wrong. The money needs to be spent. It needs to be out there with the kids instead of being held back so that they can get some award for saving money for the school year. Because, because of these two things we've just stated, that's where it becomes so complicated to get funds where you need them into the classroom. So... That was the biggest issue about money. Thank you, Becky. Well, one of the greatest ex concerns expressed in our group was that the money is not following the research. And so we had a professor from Texas Tech talk about, OK, we have older research that says it takes you know, four to seven years to learn a language. And some of the newer research may indicate even a longer period to learn the language. Um, there was also research around uh, paraprofessional pipelines that we discussed, uh, talking about, well, where is the state spending its money? Uh, is it giving incentives right now uh, to, to programs where teachers are less likely to, to have staying power in schools? Or should it be funding paraprofessional pipelines that, that we know that research shows uh, will lead to to teachers development of teachers that are one culturally competent and also are more likely to stay uh, in these schools and have less teacher turnover. So following the research, we also discussed the increase of the funding 
um, increasing that. We talked about the first but now listening to David. I don't know. You have to relook that. <laughs> but um, we also talked about something I thought was a little interesting. Uh, we talked about a um, newcomer center, but looking at either kind of working with collaborated districts, um, and it would be more of a transition, so maybe like a six-week period where they can come, talk about immunizations, but in all times working with district personnel that are building relationships, yet it's kind of focused uh, for recent arrivals on the needs that they might have. And so we were trying to brainstorm what, what could we do that might be a little bit different, still get some funding with that, um, but yet still support students within six weeks and then kind of return them back to their home campus. We kind of... Um, discuss my concern was um, well as a recent arrival sometimes there's a lot of fear there as well and so they're not they may not want to go somewhere else because of other factors and so we talked about that how could we minimize that so but it was I thought it was a great idea at least something to start um, looking at how can we become more um, specific on supporting our recent arrivals, especially for districts that maybe not have a lot of recent arrivals, but um, just kind of thinking through what could we do with the supported effort from maybe a neighboring district. A lot of what was mentioned is something we had also discussed at our table. Um, in addition to that, we also discussed some, just the need to, to help everybody just look at this as not an us versus them issue. Because at the end of the day, we talked about how important it was to kind of refocus the legislature in terms of seeing this more as a full-fledged program and not pilots, as we've been doing it for, for many, many years. And so when you hear the word pilot, then that means limited funds. That means for a limited amount of time. That means prove yourself at every step of the way. And so we talked about how um, it really is time to make this a full-fledged program, potentially stop all the acronyms and decide on one thing so that... <laughs> It can all go under one umbrella. But more than that, it's really also kind of repositioning it as, and I think it was mentioned earlier, the idea of looking at it as dual credit achievement versus remediation. Um, and how does that tie then to ultimately having the legislature understand the financial impact and the ties to the money and sizing the, the, the money at the end of the rainbow with this investment towards kids. And so that's how we looked at some of the funding in addition to the discussions of teachers, et cetera, and certifications. Uh, my group was actually discussing about that. We said instead of doing like the 0.1 or 0.1, why don't go ahead and ask for more than 1.5 because our students really need this. And the disparity between ELO and SPED, I know they had mentioned earlier it's different, but as long as like weighing your program, seeing where the money needs to go because some students do need ELO and do need SPED or sometimes they get put into the wrong programming without actually learning about the student in that aspect. So going where the money needs to be, not just where you think it needs to be. Thank you. Well, uh, at table number nine, the great people there. <laughs> no, we all, we, all, we all talked about the historic underfunding that has been uh, consistently provided for uh, EOLs. And that that funding is based on perhaps past needs and not current accurate needs. And so that needs to be communicated to the legislature and uh, sold in a, in a perhaps a, a different package than how it's been tried. I'm sorry? That was a concern they had? Yes. Uh, and also uh, perhaps making the community uh, more aware and more uh, participant in the political process because that obviously translates into votes, which uh, ultimately ends up calling the attention of uh, the legislature at any level. And accountability of funds within the district so that uh, basically you get into the uh, supplement, not supplant issue, so that the funds that are aimed towards bilingual or EOL uh, programs are used for that and not uh, for other things. I want to thank our uh, panelists for reflecting your uh, facilitators, table facilitators, reflecting uh, the comments that your group um, discussed over the hour, over lunch. Thank you for these ideas. Uh, you know, this is the stuff we need to take with us and go back to our own various locus of control and uh, be spreading this thinking, this talking. We need to get people uh, concerned and talking about um, these populations of kids who have been disenfranchised, underserved, poorly served, 
in our public schools. We are never going to be any better until we learn to do better. And we will never do better until we are committed to that, until it is our intention to do better uh, uh, by uh, uh, students. Uh, in this case, our English language learners at the secondary level, they have as much right, Eduardo, I think, uh, to a good education as any other population in our public schools. And if we're not serving them and serving others, we are not serving our own best interests as a nation. I've been telling people around the nation, this really is a matter of national security. We could be spiting and cutting off our own face and spiting uh, ourselves by not getting kids ready. I mean, really ready for the realities of this world that we are already in. We are already halfway through the second decade of the 21st century. We can't talk about it like it's coming. It is here. And we have to make real decisions about what we do for these young men and women who are about ready to step out and begin to face life outside of public schools, outside of mom and dad, and any other protections they may have in terms of concerned family members. We must get them ready. So when I told you this morning there was nothing better you could do than to be here today talking about these issues, helping us as an organization, Intercultural Development Research Association, to look at these issues, people like Maldef, David, and other concerned citizens in this community of practitioners and experts uh, to think about what we need to be doing differently to create uh, what Kuka says on one of these slides. Uh, a, a new narrative, a new narrative for a new century. We can't, you know, keep looking back. We really need to be leaning forward, looking forward, working forward where these populations of kids are concerned in our public schools. And to do less than that is to have made up our minds already for failure, already to repeat and, and recreate what we have been doing rather than what we need to do. And so we hope at IDRA, this is the beginning of a new conversation. We can't thank you enough for having been a part of it, for taking time out of your very busy days uh, to, to be here with us and to think about uh, these issues and thank uh, Dr. Jimenez Castaneda uh, Ayanos for uh, what you have done to see this conversation in your work and the work of others. It is hugely important. I want to call our president and see, oh, by the way, uh, be sure to slide your uh, group's conversation notes down to me now before you leave the table. I don't want to have to run after you. Uh, and uh, those thoughts will be important. And if any of you have any written comments you want to share with us, be sure uh, to turn them over either to me or to your table leaders so that we can have those as well. I want to invite up uh, Dr. Maria Cuca Robledo Monticel, who is going to introduce our closing speaker and take care of tying up our day. Oh, we have a visitor with us as well. Oh, yeah, please, uh, you can return to your seat. Give him a big hand, please. A wonderful day. Do you think? Yes, a great day. Um, I um, have been impressed with the, the breadth of the conversation, with the depth of the knowledge that you bring, with the willingness that you have uh, to share it. And I am uh, deeply thankful to each of you uh, for being here. And um, there will be a uh, symposium uh, proceedings document that we will, of course, share with you. Uh, there is also the archived copy that Nowcast SA created that you will have access to, and you can use it uh, as you wish. And then, of course, tomorrow, as I said early in the day today, uh, we will continue with a policy meeting in Austin to take what we talked about today um, and take it to uh, Austin for policy deliberations there. So it's been a great day and I thank you. 
you know, like me, you um, probably have been at many settings where people ask you, well, to what do you attribute your success? And uh, inevitably, if there are Latinos and minority people in the audience, they will stand up and name someone in their family. Someone in their family who made all the difference with their love, with their care, with their guidance. And so today I want to reintroduce you to Raquel Mijares. You, of course, uh, met Raquel as a uh, panelist uh, in this last panel. But I want to tell you a little bit about Raquel. She is a senior here at Our Lady of the Lake University. She is president of the Bilingual Education Student Organization here. Her certification will be in early childhood to sixth grade with a concentration in bilingual education. So her intention, her plan, and what she has prepared herself to do is precisely what we were talking about today. And that is to make sure that all children, including those who are learning English, have access to a great life as a result of the great education that they receive. Raquel graduates with a Bachelor of Arts in Bilingual Education. Bachelor of Science? A Bachelor of Science this December 2015 from Our Lady of the Lake. Her goal, she tells us, is to become a great bilingual teacher and to give back to her community what she has been given. Raquel is originally from San Antonio. Her father was born and raised in Mexico, and her mother met her father there as a missionary from San Antonio. Raquel went to school in Edgewood and graduated from Northside. She attended pre-K to second grade bilingual uh, classrooms. And uh, Spanish uh, was and is her first language. I guess once you have Spanish as a first language, it always is that. Uh, so that's what it is for me, and I know for many of you here in the room, and certainly uh, it is so for Raquel. Raquel is glad to speak Spanish um, as she is able to have a closer relationship with her grandparents. And today, as her special guest, she has her grandmother, la señora Reina Rodríguez, que nos acompaña esta tarde. Muy bienvenida, señora Rodríguez. He estado hablando un poquitito de tanta cosa bonita y buena que ha hecho su nieta. Y ahora hemos estado hablando todo este día de cómo mejorar las escuelas para las criaturas que hablan dos idiomas. Gloria a Dios. Y le vamos a pasar ahora a Raquel. Ella va a tener la última palabra. ¿eh? Thank, you. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. My name is Raquel Mijares, as she had mentioned before. Um, I am a senior here at Lady Lake University. Um, I am majoring in bilingual education. I actually am very thankful for this opportunity and very nervous, but it's a great thing what this is doing to us. His research, Dr. I'm sorry, Castellanos, his research really founded a lot of what my actual own educational career was. I was in Edward District. I was in the bilingual education. And you do see the differences it is. My first language happened to be Spanish, but because I had the good foundation in Spanish, I was able to learn English. And so I did understand how his research, there's not a lot of opportunities for people to learn two languages. And he does, there's not more funding that needs to be done. There's a lot more clarification that needs to be given out to the public. I was lucky enough to be in a bilingual classroom. My siblings, unfortunately, were not, but it's because the stereotypical stuff and because we're not informed as well as we should be. I came here to Our Lady of the Lake University and I could have gone to so many other universities here in San Antonio, but I chose Our Lady, Our Lady of the Lake University because of the educational program that it provided. I did my research. The program here was amazing. I love the program. I love the one-on-one -on -one that I have with my professors. I didn't want to go into a classroom with 200 other students. I wanted to have the small environment classroom. Coming into here three years ago, I never thought I would be in this position. I want to thank my professor, Dr. Belinda Sharon Trevino, because she's the one that helped me and pushed me forward. Um, she told me, you can do this, you can do that. 
go for this leadership roles that I never would have thought I would have been able to do. I learned it here, conferences, um, special interest groups that we have gone to. Because I'm part of the bilingual education student organization known as VESO, I have been part of TABE, which is the Texas Association of Bilingual Education. And because of that, we have been able to go to the national conferences here for the past two years, which is the National Association of Bilingual Education. And we have been able to present there. We have a special interest group where me, and I call them my girls, but because they are my girls, my friends, we go and present. I actually have one. I have my vice president right now, that Itaka. Would you please stand up? Darita has been my vice president and she has been a great support. So we are actually, this university is grows you and empowers you to become a better leader. It grows you to become a better future teacher. And I think even if it's at the secondary level as your research did, it still needs to be out there and supported as well because no matter who you are, as teachers, we don't wanna fail our students. As a future teacher, I do not wanna fail my students. And this is what it's all about. I came from this kind of background. I grew up, this is my neighborhood. My grandmother never went to college. She barely finished high school. My grandfather went up to the third grade here. He, they're both from Piedras Negras, which is a border town. My grandfather worked so hard for his family to push him forward and push him forward. My grandmother pushes me to the limit. My grandfather pushes me to the limit to keep going, to keep going. And she knows, she knows it. Even though she will not speak English with me, she understands me, my grandfather too. And I wanna thank them both because of that. And I wanna thank the Lord too, because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here where I am today. I thank my parents because of that as well. There, you need those people to push you, not just your own family, but your, as educators of the people, you set the example for me. You set the example for me to be the best that I can be. And if that means that I have to go out there and do the best that I can, I am gonna do it to the fullest of my extent. This is amazing. I love this opportunity. His research touched me because it's what I was. It's who I am. I was a person who was just a Spanish speaking. Going into a monolingual classroom was the scariest aspect of my whole career. Even now as a college student, it's still scary trying to go ac academically because you're like, oh, I have my conversation, but academically it's harder as it is. We do need that support. We do need that help. I see it with my own cousins because they're trying to struggle in their Spanish and English and it's not the same. So I really thank you all for coming to our wonderful university, our Lady Lake University. Um, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. If you have any questions, and don't forget, our Lady Lake is very great. Our education program is amazing. We were actually one of the pioneers to start the degree in bilingual education back in the 1960s. So I'm very proud of this school. I carry it in my heart. I carry everything here that I have with me. Um, I'm going to say in Spanish, if y'all don't mind, I want to direct some words to my grandma. Sorry. Pero abuelita, gracias por estar aquí. Excuse me. Grandma, usted ha sido un apoyo por mí por tantos años. Usted sabe que... He tardado tanto para estar en este momento. Me sigue apoyando, me sigue dirigiendo. Sin ustedes, pues no estaría aquí yo junta. Ah, le agradezco porque, pues, siendo la madre de mi mamá, me ha ayudado tanto. Gracias a Dios porque ustedes me han apoyado en todo lo que he hecho, todas las decisiones que he hecho. Um, usted sabe que no comencé como maestra, comencé con... Quería dirigirme a negocios y usted me dijo no. Cuando le dije quería ser maestra, usted fue la primera que me dijo sí, mi hija. Ah, so yo sé, yo, yo, yo su, con permiso, yo siempre sabía que ibas a ser maestra. Siempre lo sabía. Eres una, me dijo siempre ibas a ser maestra porque yo te veo con los niños y veo la pasión que tienes con estar con ellos. Entonces yo siempre sabía que eres ser maestra, pero todo en su momento. Y le agradezco eso, gran porque usted me enseñó. Usted enseñó a mi mamá, me apoyan en todo lo que hago y en todo lo que voy a estar. Y le agradezco a Dios porque ha estado en mi vida, es mi abuela. Y pues también le quiero dirigir las palabras, no nomás a mi abuela, pero a mi abuelo también, que no está aquí presente. Pero ellos han sido un soporte para mí inmenso. 
a mi familia, a mis padres y a mis hermanos. Siempre están ahí apoyándome y lo agradezco todo porque es por la gracia de Dios por todo esto. Ramo, te quiero mucho. Te agradezco y muchas gracias, Ramo, por estar aquí. Es un, un gran privilegio tenerle a usted aquí en mi casa. Entonces, This woman right here has supported us, has supported her family here in the West Side. She pushed her family forward out there. She would go out and say, candy apples. She puts all her children to go forward. She pushes her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and her great-great-grandchildren as well. She is the living breath of my family, and she helps me and decide who I am. I also want to thank, I have, my two, I have two of my younger siblings here. I'm going to embarrass them right now, but I love them both. I have my younger brother, Juan Josue Mijares. Would you please stand up? And then I have my little sister, Ruth Bastimihadis, please stand up. Those are my siblings, and that's who I strive for also. I see them, and I want them to be the best that they can be. And being as an older sister, I want to set that example for them. Again, thank you for everything. Would you please come up? Thank you. Have a nice day and enjoy. I'm glad you visited our campus and feel free to come back again. A la próxima. Hasta luego.